How are we doing? It's well, good to be with you. you, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for being willing to have a conversation. Of course. I think it's so important for us to talk about real issues that we're going through and to hear what your perspective is on how we might be able to solve some of these problems through our political system. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Well, it's, you. it's lovely to be here, and I appreciate you all coming out, and I appreciate most of all the theme of today because, you know, I, I have some very personal experience in our family with addiction, and I know we're talking about hope through recovery, and rebuilding our lives. And I know that a lot of you have very personal stories and I certainly have some personal stories too. I'm also thrilled to be here in part because my lovely mom, mom, raise your hand, is out here with us today. And uh, she, uh, as you may know, she actually, she actually works in addiction and recovery now. So awesome. Herself having, I think um, she's now almost 10 years clean and sober. So we're very proud Come of on. mom and very proud to have you here, mom. I love you. I think we really should celebrate that because sobriety is a very significant achievement. Absolutely it is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, today we're going to take some questions from the audience okay. and hear from them about some of the issues that are important to them. And again, we're just happy to have the conversation. So my first question, our first question is going to come from Christopher Newell. Great. Are you nearby, Christopher? Excellent. Go ahead and ask your question to the senator. Yes, Senator Vance, I'd like to just say welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here. Thank you, man. It's great to be here. Um, a brief introduction before I get to my question. Uh, my name is Christopher Newell. I'm a veteran who proudly and honorably served my country in the United States Air Force. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Likewise. And I'm still serving my country now. I'm a software engineer. I work for a local company here in Govini. Uh, we develop AI software at the Department of Defense. So I'm still helping this country protect uh, its, its citizens. So I, I take honor in that. It's all about giving back to this country that's given me so much. Um, but I'm also 41 months sober uh, this month. Um, that is, thank you, thank you. That is what I'm most proud of. Um, and two years ago, um, there was a call on my life to make a career change, so I actually went back to school, um, halfway completed with my master's program in addiction uh, counseling and psychology Good at Grand Canyon you. University. Good for you, man. That's awesome. Thank you. And my veteran status has allowed me to qualify for Chapter 31 benefits through the VA. But in qualifying for that, I had to prove to them I could find a job. So I went out to the Labor Bureau uh, website for statistics, and what I found there was both uh, helpful and heart heartbreaking. Um, they say over the next 10, 10 years, there's going to be a need for 72,800 addiction counselors in this country. Uh, addiction is growing at a rate of 6.5% almost a year. Um, and the experts say we haven't even experienced the, the, the COVID wave of addiction to hit these country shores. And they say it's expected within, the one, within one to two years. Uh, before you came out, Pastor Jason said that everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. The dynamic of that statement has changed over the last decade. Ten years ago, you could have said, and ended that sentence with struggling with addiction. Now it's safe to say everybody knows somebody who knows somebody that has died from an overdose in this country, and it's sad. It's heartbreaking. So um, I, I really appreciate you letting me ask this question. It tells me you, you're concerned and you care, and I appreciate that. It's time that this country stops sweeping this under the rug and we deal with it. So my question to you is, what can President Trump and you do to end the addiction crisis in this country? Yeah. Well, first of all, man, let's give it up for 41 months clean and sober. Yeah. That's a big yeah. deal. Yeah. And we're proud of you. We're rooting for you, man. It's incredible. And look, you know, th this one question, I know we've got a few other questions we want to get to. This one question I could probably talk about for the whole time. And, you know, it's, it's funny. My, my mom and I were, were on our way over here. And um, my mom was like, so, you know, what are we doing? I was like, well, we're going to this addiction to recovery event. And mom said, well, why are they talking to you? You're no expert on addiction to recovery. They should be talking to me. And I said, well, mom, we'll put you up here on stage if we need to. But no, we, we won't do that to you, mom. I'm, but look, what, what, what we need to do is, first of all, Chris, you know this so well. And I've spent a lot of time in, in Narcotics Anonymous meetings, AA meetings with uh, with mom, just because I want to be supportive. And also, I think it's a great community, right? For those of you who've known and seen it, it's, it's an amazing community. But one of the things you see is, you know, you see the same person, right? And, and the first time you see her, she's getting her four-week medallion. And the second time you see her, she's getting her six-month medallion. And the third time you see her, she's getting her nine-month medallion. And then you don't see her again. 
And then you talk to people and they'll tell you, well, unfortunately, she backslid. She took something, it had fentanyl in it, and she died of an overdose. And I think that what this fentanyl crisis has done is it's deprived us of so many second chances. Because all of us who know somebody who's struggling with addiction, look, you get back on the horse and sometimes you fall off. And then sometimes you get back on the horse and you fall off again. You got to keep getting back on the horse because we believe in second chances. But something that takes away these second chances is all of the fentanyl that's coming into our country is stopping those second chances dead in their tracks. And we've got to get it out of our country and make our streets safe so that people can get clean and stay clean. And if, if they backslide, it doesn't take their lives. Because I think that's something that's very different about having seen my own mom go through this struggle. What's so different now compared to a long time ago is, you know, 15 years ago, you had people backslide. And of course, you had people die of overdoses. But it was so uncommon for somebody to take one thing and have that thing in their life. Now you have people who've been clean and sober for a year, for two years, one mistake. And that's it. And that's the thing that we really have to fix. We've got to keep on being safe enough or we have to rebuild a country where we're safe enough to actually give people the second chances that they need. That's, that's number one. Now, the second thing is, look, when people want to take that first step to addiction and recovery, we've got to make it easy for them, right? Because sometimes it is the first step that's the hardest. And I'm sure all of us know somebody who've dealt with detox, who've dealt with those first 48, 72 hours where it's just a nightmare, and I actually, you know, have had people in my own family who have volunteered to host people to do detox for 48 or 72 hours because until you detox, sometimes you can't even get into a treatment facility. So you've got to expand those options for people to take that first step to recovery. And I think part of that is empowering, you know, people like Pastor Jason. There are a lot of church groups. There are a lot of Christian people out there that would love to be playing a role and helping out. Unfortunately, sometimes our federal government says... If you're a person of faith, we don't want you helping out. And I think our attitude ought to be, if you're a person of faith, we welcome you to help out because you're doing it for the right reasons, and that's what we want. That's fundamental. We want to empower Christian charity, not try to destroy it from the government level, which is unfortunately what we've seen way too much. And the final point that I'd say is, is Chris, talk about access to treatment. One of the best things um, to come out of the last few years, and, and, you know, you always try to look for silver linings. Obviously, COVID was a disaster, but one of the silver linings of COVID is that it opened up telehealth, and telehealth has made it possible for people to get access to treatment in a way, and mom and I were talking about this on the way over here. This is my expert mom giving me what to say here, but... You know, telehealth is actually, in a lot of cases, set to expire for a lot of people in early 2025. We got to renew that and reauthorize it to give people access to the treatment that they need. And that's something that Donald Trump and I are going to fight for every single day if you all give us the, uh, the honor of putting us back in the White House. Thank you. So, thank you. So just on a follow-up to that, you know, we see on our city streets right now how the addiction crisis and I think some mental health crises that are intertwined with that sure. are affecting the livability of our city. And we see people who are on the street who are clearly in a state of crisis. And I think that we've really wrestled, and I know I can speak from this from personal experience here in Pittsburgh, we've really wrestled with how do we handle this, this crisis of humanity? Sure. Clearly these people need help. What's the solution? Um, crime can be attached to that. Safety is attached to that. But yet these people also truly need help. And so what, what can a government response be to that problem? Yeah. Well, let me, let me just say a couple, couple things on first. When I talk about getting the fentanyl out of our country, let's be honest, and I don't want to make this too partisan, but of course I'm a presidential, vice presidential candidate, so we might as well be honest about the policy. Why do we have so much fentanyl in our community? And why do we have a lot of people who are struggling, living on the streets, unable to get clean, dying of overdoses, it's because we have an administration that has let the Mexican drug cartels put this stuff into our country, and we've got to stop that. We, we, we need a border policy that protects American citizens, that helps facilitate people getting on the path to recovery, not facilitating Mexican drug cartels to kill our citizens. And that's the number one reason I believe we got to fire Kamala Harris and not give her a promotion. That's, let's start there. Now, 
Yeah, Pastor Jason, to answer your question, I mean, you know, p- part of that's connected, right? Because a lot of the people who are on the streets, and it's not just fentanyl increasingly. We talk to police officers all the time where, you know, the, the fentanyl is what's leading to a lot of overdose deaths. But when you deal with somebody on the street that's really, really aggressive, that assaults a law enforcement officer, whether it's meth or some other street drug, we've got to make it easier for police officers to keep us safe. And part of that is taking the drugs off the street that lead people to attack police officers, right? It sounds like common sense, but unfortunately, we don't have an administration right now that believes in common sense. And, and then there's an element of money to this, right? Think about this. Whether you're in Pittsburgh or anywhere else, what we're hearing is that municipal budgets have been stressed to the breaking point. And, and who, you know, we ask ourselves, okay, when a police officer goes out to a person who's living on the streets and tries to bring them in to get them the treatment they need, that police officer costs money. The treatment they need costs money. If you're going to put that person in a mental health care facility, that mental health care facility costs money. Well, where is all of our money going right now? In part, we've got a lot of money going to people who don't have the legal right to be in this country. And I believe we've got to get them out of here and show compassion first for our own citizens. Now, that, that doesn't mean, of course, that doesn't mean that you can't have compassion for everybody. But as an American leader, as a person who wants to be the next vice president of the people in this room, American resources and American compassion have to go first to American citizens. And we have to build our country up to a strong place. And that's what allows us to be helpful and compassionate towards other people. Right now, our country is disintegrating from the inside. I mean, there is a lot of talk out there about, you know, we got to promote economic opportunity. We got to get the price of groceries lower. We got to get the price of housing lower. If you go to some of our most distressed communities, if you go to some of the poorest neighborhoods, whether it's Pittsburgh or somewhere else, you see thousands, I'm talking about across our country, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who desperately need help. And the government right now is more focused on providing help to people who don't have the legal right to be here. That is a broken, broken promise from our government, and we've got to fix that. Thank you. Of course. So our next question is coming from Rose. Hello, Sam, Senator Vance. My name is Rose Owens. I'm actually from another battleground state, Wisconsin. Great. And I thank you for being here in Pittsburgh. My family and I have lived here now for 10 years, my husband and three boys, two of whom are here with me right now. Um, Right now I'm homeschooling my children, but formerly I taught in the public school. I currently teach in a homeschool enrichment center in addition to my own children. And as a mom and an educator, I'm extremely concerned about socialism being pushed so strongly in our education system. It's being essentially forced in our higher education system and then filtering Mm. down to our young ones, even in the elementary ages. So what is it that we can do to save our schools and our children? Sure. Well, ma'am, first of all, you got a beautiful family there. Who's that you're holding? Thank you. This is Elliot. Elliot. Elliot, thank you for coming, buddy. He doesn't, (laughs) he has no idea what's going on. I trust me. I've got three little kids and uh, he is an extraordinarily well-behaved baby (laughs) to be to actually show the patience for this so you're a good mom you've got a beautiful family thank you so much and i appreciate you you doing what you're doing and i appreciate your question um please but i you know i I think we got to be honest here that why is there increasing socialism and not you know look liberalism conservatism we can disagree about policy. We can disagree about regulatory policy. Some of the stuff that they're teaching in American schools in 2024, that, that's not just liberalism. That is craziness. And we've got to get it out of our schools or it's going to poison the minds of our young people. And we've got to start today. In fact, we should have started yesterday. And and ma'am, a big part of this, and I've tried to understand this, I've been a senator for a couple of years, and I've tried to understand where is all this crazy curriculum coming from. And the honest and unfortunate answer is very often it's paid for by tax dollars. In other words, it's paid for by those of us in this room. And you ask how that happens is, is the answer is, well, the Federal Department of Education pays a lot of money to develop curriculum that goes into our schools. Well, the money, the people they give money to 
are very often some of the most radical organizations in the world that are developing curriculum that is pro-socialism, I would say pro-racism, that teaches really crazy ideas on gender that we just don't want in American schools. And it, yeah, I mean, it, it has two negative consequences. Well, first of all, the American education system used to be the envy of the world, rich or poor alike. We believe in this country that every person deserves a quality education. Well, now we've got American children who can't add five plus five, but they can tell you that there are 87 different genders. And I think both of those things are related because we're teaching kids radical ideas. We're not teaching them the basics. We're not teaching them reading writing, arithmetic, the things that every child needs in order to live a good life. And that is, to your point, this creeping socialism in our schools. We've got to get it out of there. And I think we cut off the money. Stop spending your tax dollars on radical organizations that are poisoning the minds of our kids. And, and, and I also, ma'am, I, I think another solution, and this is something I know that President Trump and I really believe in, and frankly, Pennsylvania has had an opportunity that it hasn't taken advantage of because, you know, I, I think some of your political leadership in the state could have done a better job here. But we got to believe in school choice in this country. The, the best, you know, you, you and, I, and I'm sure you got a lot of options out there. I'm sure it's not easy to devote yourself to teaching kids. I mean, we, we you know, we, we have a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old, ma'am, so I know exactly where you are. And, you know, we've been doing just on the campaign trail because we bring our kids on the campaign trail with us a little bit. So my wife has been doing a little bit of homeschooling. And it maybe is the hardest job in the world is to homeschool a seven-year-old. So God bless you. You're doing amazing with it. But we, we, it goes to show, like, we need to give every American family choice. And if we give American parents more choices, they're not going to cho choose socialism. They're not going to choose racial craziness. They're going to choose good education for their children, and that is the best way to cut out this rot in American public education. And I think we have to start immediately. Increase school choice, and that's a big part of the solution. Let me, let me just offer one, one final thought on this, because you know, this, this matters to me personally, not just because I love our country and I want our kids to have a good education, but you know, I, I was lucky enough to grow up in the United States of America in the 1990s, at a time when we told American families and we told American children that it didn't matter whether you were black or white or any other skin color, it just mattered what your character was as a person and that we were all part of the same American family. Now, I grew up, I went to school, I went to law school, and when I was in law school, I met this person that I thought was the most beautiful, most lovely, smartest, kindest human being in the entire world. And because I grew up in a country that didn't teach us to see skin color first and foremost, I fell in love with a person who wasn't the same skin color as me. And that's a cool thing that could only happen in the United States of America. And I think because I've got biracial children, and I'm sometimes asked by reporters, they'll say, well, do you think your children should be Indian or do you think they should be white? And I'll say, I think they should be American because that's what unites us together as a common family. But, 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 but I, I really think, unfortunately, far too many American children don't have what I had growing up in America in the 1990s, going to a public high school that was ranked near the bottom of, of public schools in the state of Ohio, but I think still gave me a very, very good education. This constant obsession with, are you a victim or are you an oppressor? Let's put people in different racial buckets and then try to determine whether if you're in this racial bucket, do you belong to the victim or oppressor group? And if you're in that racial bucket, you belong to another group. We're teaching American children to see their fellow people as members of a racial group instead of human beings, instead of children of God. It is a mistake, and we've got to go in the other direction in this country. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We're going to take another question, um, basically on the topic of cost of living. And so for that, sure. I'm going to take it to um, Jared, who's a 22-year-old, concerned about his ability to start and support a family. Okay. So Jared. Jared, how, how are you doing? doing? Senator? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? Good. Thank you. Thank you for spending your time with us uh, this evening. Um, I'm 22 years old. Like they said, I desire to start a family. Um, God bless you, man. Thank you. Desire to start a family, you know, not live on the edge of 
just fending for the leftovers of, of the money I have or whatever. What is your action plan for, you know, affordable cost of living, affordable wages, all those such things for young families who want to start a healthy family, who want to start a, have a healthy journey and not live off the edge of the crumbs. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And, you know, Jared, let me just say, I, I grew up in a family where we struggled with money a lot when I was growing up. We very often, you know, just felt like we couldn't even afford some of the basic things that we need needed. And I'll say this, that when I was a young man, when I was a teenager, the thing that I wanted more than anything was just to become a good husband and a good father. I wanted to be able to give my kids the things that I didn't have when I was growing up. So I honor you for your commitment to, to being a family man, to starting a family. And I think for most young men, the American dream includes starting a family and becoming a father. And we ought to make that easier with our public policy and not harder, which is unfortunately what we've been doing for the last few years in this country. And, and let me just give you some specifics here, because when I, when I hear people talk about, look, I think there are three big, big problems that we have when it comes to giving young men and young women the necessary parts of being able to build some real financial stability, some real financial wealth, so then they can start a family from a position of strength. Number one, we want high wages. We want good jobs that pay an affordable living wage, not just jobs that pay a minimum wage that allow people to scrape by. And I think a big part of that is encouraging our country to build more factories, to build more good manufacturing jobs, and to, and I, and I appreciate y'all clapping that, but, but, but a big part of this is when my grandfather was growing up, and even when my father was growing up, we didn't tell everybody that to earn a middle class wage, you had to go to college. I think we got to tell everybody whether you want to go to college or don't want to go to college, there ought to be good jobs available for everybody who's willing to work hard, willing to learn, and willing to play by the rules. And that's and I, and I, and I don't know I don't know Jared your educational background, but whether you want to go get a college degree, go become a doctor, or whether you want to go and work in a factory, which a lot of people say working in a factory is working with your hands. Well, it is working with your hands, but it's also working with your mind. And I think that we we got to remember that important lesson for our young people is there are a lot of good jobs out there. It's my job as vice president to make sure there are more. And we got to build a culture where people can go and work in whatever job they see fit to live their American dream and provide for their families. So that's number one. By the way, just just I want to give you a statistic on that. You know, people will sometimes say America has the biggest economy in the world, and we do. About 20, about one quarter of all economic activity comes out of the United States of America. But you know how much manufacturing comes out of the United States of America? About 18%. You know how much manufacturing comes out of China? About 30%. That's going in the wrong direction, my friends. And unless we build more of our own stuff, are more self-reliant and more self-sufficient, we're never going to be able to provide enough good jobs for middle-class people. We've got to bring manufacturing back to this country. Now, now, there are two other things I want to say. Because, Jared, when I, when I talk to people and just look at the numbers, what I hear are, are two big reasons why it's so unaffordable. It's number one, the price of food, and number two, the price of housing. And here's what we gotta do to make housing more affordable. Number one, build more housing, and number two, cut down on illegal immigration so that American homes go to American citizens, not to people who don't have the right to be here. That's, that's how we lower the price of housing. If we want to lower the price of food, it's very simple. We got to unleash American energy and unleash American farmers. That gets food to the grocery store at a much lower cost, which means you're able to put a good meal on the table for your family. And that's what we got to get back to in this country. Groceries under Kamala Harris, man, they've gone up 25% in just three and a half years. I got three little kids. My kids eat a lot of eggs. A lot of eggs in, 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 in my family. My mom will back me up on this. Eggs have gone up 118%. That's more than doubled in just three years. We just got to get back to common sense economic policies, allow people to put food on the table. If not, what the hell are we doing in American leadership? We got to do a better job here by you, Jared, and by everybody else in this room. Speaking, you're... you're um you're connecting inflation and food costs to the energy prices. Yes, sir. And here in this part of the state, uh, you know, fracking, liquid, natural gas, this is all a, a big part of our economy here. 
And I know that you know, there's a debate around the exports of liquid natural gas sure. and a conversation around what should the response be to that. And I think that's really relevant to a lot of people here in this region. So what would you say to this, the, the um, environmental concerns around fracking and then also sort of the ability to distribute liquid natural gas? Yeah. Well, look, the more that we're able to distribute Pennsylvania natural gas, the more people that are going to have good jobs, the more wages are going to go up, and the more that we're going to be able to build a good middle-class economy for all Americans. Again, it's, it's a very simple principle that guides me and Donald Trump. When we think about the specifics of policy, we ask ourselves, how do we make it so that if you work hard and play by the rules, you can afford a good life in this country? And a, a critical foundation of that is energy. Because think about this. I mean, I, I grew up in a family where sometimes I remember my mamaw, this is my grandmother, you know, if, if times were really tight and it was really cold, sometimes she wouldn't turn on the heater because we wouldn't be able to afford it. And I think that we, we live in a country that is rich and bountiful enough. If you work hard and play by the rules, you ought to be able to turn on your heating in the middle of a cold winter night. That's the right of every American citizen who does things the right way. But it's not working right now. Because energy prices are about 30%, 35% higher than when Kamala Harris took office. What that means is a lot of American families aren't going to turn on the heater in the middle of this winter because they can't afford to. And what a disgrace in the richest country in the world, in Pennsylvania, where you've got enough natural gas to power the world for 500 years. What a disgrace to not let Pennsylvania workers get it out of the ground. That's going to change when Donald Trump and I are back in the White House. And that... And, and, and you're right, Pastor Jason, I mean, here, here the connection to this to, to food is, just think about a couple big ways, right? So ask yourself, what is the most important fertilizer that farmers use in the United States of America today? It's derived from natural gas. I didn't realize this until I got into politics. I didn't know a whole lot about farming uh, until I got into politics. Derived from natural gas. So if natural gas is too expensive... And we're not letting Pennsylvania workers get this stuff out of the ground, then what happens? That means the food goes up because the farmers are struggling to make ends meet. Here's the other thing. How do we think and I you know, sometimes you talk to you talk to people on the other side of the political aisle, and look, I, I don't mean to beat up on them, but you, you ask them, they'll say, Well, you know, I drive an electric vehicle, so you know, my energy, I just get it from plugging into the wall. And it's like, well, where do you think the, the power came when you plug it into the wall? It doesn't come from the energy ferry. Somebody's got to make that power to get it to the outlet in the first place. And what, what people don't, I think, often don't realize on the other side is, look, if, you know, if, if, if the truck drivers getting the groceries to the grocery store are paying 50% more for diesel fuel, then what's that doing to our grocery bills? It's shooting that stuff through the roof. Because if the truckers are paying more, then we're paying more. So energy, I really do think, the president says all the time, drill, baby, drill. That is the critical thing that we've got to do. Because if you lower the cost of energy, you're going to lower the cost of everything else. And that is what we've got to do for American families. Thank you. So I want to turn the conversation to faith. And obviously, you know, we're gathered here today, a lot of what has brought us together is this idea of our faith, our Christianity. That's right. And I believe, you know, as a person, and ultimately, you know, my role here is to represent, you know, who I am as a Christian, first and foremost. Of course. Before any political ideology. That's right. And, you know, I have the conviction that it's our core values as individuals that determines the decisions that we make. And so as we're considering in this election, you know, who we're voting for, who we're empowering with authority, I think that we should be asking the question, what do you as a human being believe about yourself, about God, about the world? And so can you tell us a little bit about your faith journey and the faith that guides the decisions that you make? Yeah. So look, uh, I, I guess if I were going to summarize it, I'd go straight to one of my favorite Bible verses, which is John three sixteen. Of course, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And I think there are two big important things to take out of it is number one, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That means God really loves us. And I think that especially those of us who are dealing with addiction in our family or even amongst ourselves, got to remember God loves you. 
every single day. He loves you on your worst day. He loves you on your best day, and he loves you the same all the way through. And it's important to remember that because what I, what I hear from when I, I talk to folks who sometimes, again, are struggling with addiction is there's this feeling, I think, of worthlessness that settles in yeah. when people, you know, are, are falling off that horse or yeah. when they hit rock bottom. And I think that a core tenet of the Christian faith is whether you're rich or poor, whether you come from, you know, the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks, God loves you. And that love is the source of human dignity. And it's why we have to respect every human life in this country. And it's why I think that, that, that it's, a, it's a core part of my, my belief and my faith is that God loves all of us. Now, the second part is that he sent his only begotten son. And what that means to me, and I think that, you know, I, I grew up, Pastor Jason, in, in a world where I was raised by a woman of very deep Christian faith. My grandmother, uh, even though she didn't graduate from high school, she was more profound when she thought about her faith than anybody that I've ever met. She read the Bible every single day. She thought about what it required of her. Now, she was a woman of contrast. And so if you've read my book, you know, yes, Mamaw, she very much loved the Lord. She also loved the F word, right? She, she could, and both of those things, both of those things were true at the same time. And I had to remind myself, now that I've, you know, got three little kids, I can't talk like Mamaw did. Because when you talk like Mamaw did, the seven-year-old, the four-year-old, the two-year-old repeat it. Pick up on exactly. It. Yeah. And trust me, they have. They're, yeah. they're actually right now running around suburban uh, Pittsburgh with my wife at one of her friends' house. And I'm hoping to God they don't talk like Mamaw did. Because <laughs> they, if they do, then I'll hear about it when we all hit the road. But I, I, I say that because I grew up in a Christian family. And like a lot of young kids, I went off to the Marines and I went to college. And by the time I got to college, I thought I knew everything. And I think a lot of, you know, 22, 23 year old kids, they feel like they know everything. And so I I didn't call myself a Christian when I was a young man. And I kind of, in some ways, even was a little judgmental, I would say, towards people who still did. As much as I loved my mamaw, she was no longer alive. But I thought, you know, mamaw just didn't know what was really going on in the world. And that's why she was such a devout Christian. And you think about the arrogance of that attitude to think that my grandmother, who was 70 and knew everything, that I knew more than she did as a 23-year-old. And I think I started to realize that my lack of faith came from arrogance. And the more humble that I I became about my own shortcomings, I mean, I was a young man with a terrible temper. Uh, You know, I grew up in a tough family. We had a lot of, you know, domestic violence. I mean, I I, I definitely entered young, young adulthood with a bit of a temper and then I, I met this girl, like I said, in law school, and I felt, I mean, just head over heels in love with this girl. And I remember thinking to myself, well, what is it that I most want out of my life, right? Is it money? Is it education? Is it, you know, all these worldly pursuits? Or what, what do I really want? And what I really wanted more than anything is I wanted to be a good hot husband to this woman I had fallen in love with. And I wanted to be a good father to the babies that I knew we were going to eventually have. Yeah. And when you start asking yourself, what do I need to do to be not a successful person, but a good person, to be a good husband and father, I kept on returning to the faith of mammal. I kept on returning to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, eventually, uh, I actually had never been baptized as a young man. I got baptized in 2019. So I was, you know, thank you. Um, and, and, but, but again, I, I think that, you know, for, for those of us who are Christians, I ask myself this question a lot is why is it that young people, like myself, discard their faith even when they're raised in the faith? And I think a big part of the answer is that they don't think that the Christian faith answers questions that are important to their life. And I think one of the things that we can do as Christians is that we can constantly remind people that life's biggest questions, the questions that really matter, are questions that are best answered by the Christian faith. And that's what I try to remind people of when I go out there and talk about my faith. Because look, it's been such a blessing to me like, I, you know, I believe it. I think it's important. I think that, you know, all, all the teachings of the gospel are true, but it, completely aside from the truth of it, I think being a Christian has made me a better person, and I try to communicate that to people. Don't think you know everything, and don't think that 2,000 years of Christian tradition, if you're a 23-year-old and you think you know more than those people, what you are is arrogant. Mm-hmm. There's not intelligence or wisdom. There's arrogance there, and I think if we had a more humble approach to this thing, that's at least what brought me back to my faith. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And one of the things that you said, and 
You know, I think this is so important when it comes to our understanding of humanity from a Christian perspective, yeah. sort of the inherent value and worth of every individual. That's right. And I think that, you know, when we're looking at government policies, the way that Christians have historically sort of thought about that intrinsic worth of people, that's affected our thinking around abortion and issues of life. I think that it's, um, it also affects what we think about addiction and response, of course. homelessness. And I also think there's an element of, okay, the intrinsic value of every person when it comes to the border crisis. And so obviously <clears throat> there are different opinions about how we resolve some of these problems. Sure. But can you speak directly to how your belief in the intrinsic value of every human being, which is a Christian idea, how that Absolutely. shapes your perspective of policy? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, you, you read world history, and world history, the, the number one thing that I take away from it is the world was extraordinarily gruesome until about 2,000 years ago. And then people started have, having this idea that it wasn't just the powerful that deserved the protection of law, it was everybody. Everybody deserved the protection. And indeed, if you were a powerful person in society, you ought to use your power, power for the betterment of other people and not to take advantage of other people. And I think that's fundamentally, you know, Christian social teaching is that every life, no matter how vulnerable, no matter how, you know, if some people might think it's inconvenient, Every human life has inherent meaning and inherent worth, and we have to protect it. Now, of course, there are questions about, you know, how do you actually do that? And, of course, you know, you can get into the nitty-gritty, and we can have disagreements. I'm sure even in this room of, among Christians, we're going to have disagreements about how best to do that. But I, I think that fundamentally we have to always root our, our politics and our political views in an understanding that we are called to a higher purpose— and we're called to treat every human life with inherent dignity. Now, the border is, is let's just take that as, as maybe the hardest case, of yeah. course, because I really do believe as an American leader and a person who wants to be your next vice president, my first responsibility is to America's citizens. And I think there, there is this Christian idea that you owe the strongest duty to your family, and then you owe the next duty to your community, and then to your country, and then to everybody else. So it doesn't mean that you have to be mean to other people, but it means that your first duty as an American leader is to the people of your own country. And I think that there are ways in which we can, in fact, be compassionate towards other people. And I actually think that our approach, the, the, the Trump-Vance approach to the border, is the way to maximize compassion, not just for our citizens, but for everybody. And let me give you a couple of examples of this. Okay, so right now, in the United States, we have about 320,000 children that we have lost track of. Now, these are children, many of whom have been trafficked by drug traffickers or, God forbid, even sex traffickers. I mean, these include adolescent teenage girls that are being sold into sex slavery. The Democrats, meaning Kamala Harris, wants to tell you that the compassionate thing is to have a wide open border. I think those 320,000 missing children would beg to differ. The compassionate thing is to control our border, find those children, and punish the criminals who are mistreating them, who are trafficking them, and are making their lives more difficult. Border policy is compassionate, and I think that Republicans have to remind people of that because, look, again, my first duty is to American citizens, but we should not let the left of this country, we should not let Kamala Harris claim the high ground on compassion when her policies have led to 320,000 missing children in the United States of America. It's a disgrace and there's nothing compassionate about it. Thank you. So one final question, <clears throat> one final question, and again, it's on the topic of faith. And so I wanna take it um, to Grace, a 22 year old from Irwin. Would you ask? Hi, Senator Vance. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to thank you again so much for being here. It's such an honor to have you with us. Um, uh, again, I'm Grace. Um, I came from Irwin, Pennsylvania. Nice to meet you, Grace. <laughs> nice to meet you. And uh, I actually work at Grace Life Church, a local church here in Monroeville. Um, and, you know, 
working at a local church, I've just seen um, so many different things, uh, especially recently, just people threatening sometimes the 5013C. Um, also, people trying to moderate kind of what's said in churches, what's preached from the pulpit, um, who can be in there, who can't be in there, all these different things. And I guess my question is, I just want to know, with you in office, how will you support the local church? That's a very good question, Grace, and I, I appreciate you asking me. And Look, I think the first and most important thing is we have a core foundational principle in the United States of America. It's called the First Amendment. And first, the, the, the First Amendment doesn't mean anything if churches aren't allowed to preach what they think they should preach without the government or anybody else telling them what to do. That's a, that's a basic principle. And I, you know, look, we, we, we've got, I mean, We've got so many great churches and so many great religious institutions in this country. Uh, we should be encouraging them to flourish, right? We need more compassion. We need more Christian charity in the United States of America, not less. And so what Donald Trump and I, what we promise to do is to protect religious freedom, protect people's rights to say what they want to say and to worship how they want to worship in their church, and to guarantee that the government is not going to strip nonprofit status from the churches it doesn't like. Sometimes the government doesn't like a particular church because the church is telling the government something it needs to hear. And we need to remember that and fight for the right of those churches to speak their voice. I mean, look, some of the greatest evils in the history of, 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 of the world, and even some of the greatest sins in our own country, it was the Christian church that stood at the vanguard reminding leaders that they needed to care about the vulnerable and not just the powerful. If we tell the American Christian church that, they're not, that it's not allowed to preach what it wants to preach, that it's not allowed to teach the gospel to everybody in our country, then we are taking away one of the things that has made this country great in the first place, and I will never do that. In fact, I'll fight to protect it every single day. Um, what, I, one other thing I want to say, just, just in response to your question, Grace, is, is when I talk about Christian charity, I want to go into the details a little bit because, you know, one of the things, so we have two massive federal programs that spend a lot of money um, that are supposed to help people afford childcare. And some of them work and some of them don't work. But here's the thing, you know, if you're a Christian church and you would like to set up a childcare facility for the people who go to your church, you know, and Pastor Jason maybe knows this better than I do, but a lot of pastors will tell you, you cannot get access to that federal money. Well, I think that's ridiculous. Because if, 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 I'm, look, if I'm thinking about this as a father, and I need a little bit of help with child care, I'm, I'd much rather send my child to a church community that I trust and that I know, rather than being told where I have to put my child in daycare. Let parents make those decisions, and we ought to empower parents to make those calls. And I, I mean, look, I, I've, 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 I've done food banking with local churches. I know local churches that are doing detox facility for addicts. I know local churches that are running food lines and food pantries this very minute that are not getting any help. In fact, they're being harmed by the federal government. Again, I want to facilitate Christian charity because our local churches know their local communities best. We ought to be empowering them. And I think, unfortunately, our current federal government is trying to destroy them, and it's a disgrace. We're going to stop it. Thank you. Thanks. So with just a couple minutes left, any final words that you'd like to say to us? Well, yeah, and I, I know we're running short on time. First of all, let me just offer a note of gratitude here. Um, I am so, I'm so grateful to be here with all of you today. I'm so grateful for such a warm welcome for me and my mom. I know my mom, this is a, an event that she cares a lot about because she knows addiction and she knows its, its traumas and its victims so, so well. But let me, let me just offer you a couple of, of observations here. And, and one is we've got an election on November the 5th and every single one of you can do your part to help us win it. So I hope that you will. And I've, I, I haven't done too much politic and pastor Jason, but I'm going to do a little bit right now because what I'd ask each of you to do 
is do two things. Number one, there's a website called swampthevote.com, swampthevote.com. You can go there, you can check your registration, you can check your polling location, you can find various ways to get involved to make sure that you actually go and vote. That's the first thing I'll ask you to do. And the second thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to try to get not just yourself, but five friends and family members to the polls by November the 5th. Now, whether that's voting by mail or voting early or voting on election day, we are never going to have the power of the corporate media. They don't like me and they don't like Donald Trump. We're never going to have the Democrats telling the truth, but we do have the power of people. And the way to make that power visible is to not just vote, but to get your friends and family to vote too. You know this, I think better than I do, Pastor, but Christian churches, you go to church every single Sunday and you will see... You know, if you go to church, let's say that has 300 people, probably 50 of those people are people who agree with you on politics, but they never vote. We got to change that. We got to get Christians to the polls because if Christians aren't out there voting, Christians are not going to have a voice in this country. And I think that's the worst possible outcome. So please get out there and vote. But the the second, the second note I'd leave you on is let me, let me tell you a little story. And it was actually a friend of mine who was very, very influential actually to me coming back to my Christian faith. I was talking to him, it was probably January, February of 2021. And I was talking about all the problems with the Biden administration. Because remember, this is right after Joe Biden took office. And he is already starting to do things at the border that I was angry about. He was already starting to do things with election integrity that I thought were absurd and scandalous. And I was going through all of these problems. And there's a technical word for what I was doing. It's called whining. I was whining to my buddy about all of the things that I was, I was annoyed with, with the present administration. And, you know, he kind of stopped me dead on my tracks because I was thinking about whether I should run for Senate at the time. And I eventually did run. And that was, you know, the election of, of, of 2022, where I was first elected to the United States Senate for the great people of Ohio. And he said something. He said, yeah, J.D., you're right, actually. There are a lot of problems. There are a lot of reasons to be frustrated with the Biden administration. But he, 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 he then spoke to me not as a political, you know, a person that was in political dialogue with me, but as a person who was influential in me returning to my faith. And he said, yes, J.D., there are tough times and things aren't going very well, but despair is a sin. And I'd ask you all to remember that, that if we really believe in the gospel and we really believe in, in God, our God is a God of hope, not a God of despair. And so as you're going out and working on this election and as you're going out and serving your communities and going to work and raising your families, I just ask you to remember despair is a sin. Christians, we are called to hope. So let's hope that we can take this country back and make our country better. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Can we thank Senator Thank you all. God bless you all. We're going to go.